everyone and welcome back to another insightful episode of Myths and Arts podcast series. I'm your host Hitvisha and today we are diving into a topic that affects a significant portion of the population and to be precise 23% of adults in the United States are affected by varicose veins with women being nearly twice as likely to develop them compared to men. This condition is not just about cosmetic concerns. It can have serious health implications if they are not managed properly. And to help us navigate this complex issue, today we have a distinguished guest with us, Dr. Riza Ibrahim, a consultant vascular and endovascular surgeon with over 25 years of experience. Dr. Riza has trained and worked at some of the most prestigious institutions in the UK and Dubai. So we we are thrilled to have him uh, share his expertise with us today on this complex issue. So welcome to the podcast, Dr. Jiza, and thank you for your time. Thank you, Hethi. My pleasure to be here. So now let's just dive into our conversation. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Uh, varicose veins are a common condition, but the underlying mechanisms might not be well known to everybody. So, could you explain the pathophysiology of varicose veins, and what are the underlying causes that uh, causes and risk factors that are associated with it? Right. No, thank you. That's a wonderful question. Uh, obviously, uh, the. I think we should start from very basics to understand that. And once you understand the basics, then it's very easy to pick up on what might cause it. So veins, uh, as everybody knows, is a system of blood vessels that takes blood back from the peripheries, that's the legs, upper limbs, heads, etc., back towards the heart and the lungs so that the blood gets oxygenated and then the arteries take it back to the rest of the body. Now, the arteries have a pump, which is the heart, and it's a fast flowing system. Veins don't have that advantage. And if you look at the lower limbs, veins have to take blood back against gravity from down back towards the heart. So normally how they do it is by two mechanisms. One is when we take a breath in, uh, pressure in the thoracic cavity, the chest cavity becomes negative. So as we all know from our school days, uh, fluid goes from a positive pressure to a negative pressure. So uh, veins blood is dragged up the veins and also when we move our muscles contract and veins are very thin walled so they they are squeezed and blood is pushed up the veins but this is in phases because we breathe in and the next thing we do is breathe out and the muscles contract and then relax so blood in the veins is tending to go up and then fall back down to stop that happening veins are valves which are supposed to open only in one direction. That is when the blood is either sucked up or pushed up and then shut. So the column of blood in the veins moves up like that normally. In some people, unfortunately, those valves malfunction and they don't close quickly enough or they close only partially. So blood tends to pool in the legs, in the veins, in the legs. And that is the basic pathology behind varicose veins. And the main valves are situated one in the groin, what we call as a saphenofemoral junction, where the great saphenous vein goes into the common femoral vein. And the other main valve is behind the knee, where the short saphenous vein goes into the popliteal vein. These are the two areas that the valves leak normally. And uh, there are other smaller valves, which we call perforators. These are all junctions between the deep and the superficial veins. Now, the question is, why might they leak? Now, the most common cause of those valves leaking is basically unknown. It tends to run in families. There usually is a family history, uh, usually on the mother's side, and it may skip a few generations, but usually there is a family history. And those are called primary varicose veins, and those are the commonest varicose veins that you see. Now, sometimes you can get what is called secondary varicose veins. So if you can imagine these veins are taking blood from the superficial system to the deep system. If there is any back pressure from the deep system because of any obstruction, then you can make the valves uh, reflux or become incompetent because of this back pressure. And that back pressure can happen if you've previously had any what we call deep venous thrombosis in the deep veins that are blocking or scarring the deep veins. Or if you had a previous operation in your pelvis, 
where the veins have been ligated or if you've had radiotherapy these are some of the conditions that can cause secondary varicose veins these are not as common as the primary varicose veins where it happens for no obvious reason uh, i hope that was uh, helpful yes that was really a comprehensive explanation doctor and it's also it is so interesting to know how factors like genetics play a role in uh, in such a such diseases but i was also intrigued as i was looking into the statistics i was just thinking that why are women more prone to get this diseases that get this disease yeah so uh, there is a propensity towards women getting uh, more of this two two reason i mean uh, the actual reason for that is not really well known hormones may have a part to play with it uh also in the past it was always that uh, women were the people who were standing more often etc that may have a role to play with it and also uh women tend to notice blemishes in their body much more commonly than men do uh so these are some of those factors but there there may be a hormonal factor because many patients who have varicose veins complain that their veins ache or throb during their periods or usually when they're ovulating and things like that so there there probably is a hormonal relationship as well but it's not entirely clear exactly the one reason why women might have it more commonly but they do yes i understood thank you for that um, explanation now moving on we often hear about chronic venous insufficiency in connection with varicose veins so can you elaborate on this condition uh, which contributes to the development of varicose veins and what key indicators that healthcare professionals should be aware of during diagnosis sure i mean this word chronic ins- venous insufficiency uh, can actually do thing two things it might cause the the varicose veins or varicose veins may be secondary to chronic venous insufficiency and i'll explain that so when we say chronic venous insufficiency what we are talking about is a chronic long term increase in the pressure in the veins in the lower limbs mainly so uh, the pressure in the veins in the lower limbs are much more than they should normally be and it is chronically so that is it's constantly so and like we discussed before the reason for this is the veins are not emptying properly because the valves are not working and blood is pooling in the veins so there is a chronic increase in pressure sometimes you can get this chronic increase in pressure as we described before because of blockage of the deep veins like in dvt radiotherapy surgery or even a congenital disorder where there is a a blockage in the vena cava etc so chronic venous insufficiency can both cause varicose veins and can be secondary to varicose veins as well now when you have this chronic long term increase in pressure in the veins it causes certain things so when there's chronic pressure some of the fluid sometimes spills out into the tissue and the body sort of recognizes it as a foreign uh, substance and so the body sends macrophages laden with what we call hemosiderin a pigment to try and go to those areas and the areas where that the pressure the chronic pressure is reflected is usually the most dependent part of the body that is just above your ankle what we call the gaiter area above the medial malleolus and below the calf uh, muscle muscle so in those areas because of the chronic increased pressure and what we just described you can get what is called pigmentation that is a blackish discoloration can appear the skin can become very dry you can obviously get swelling edema because tissue uh, fluid is spilling out into the tissue you can get a chronic ache in that area especially after sitting or standing because your blood is pooling in that area and sometimes the skin becomes so thin and uh, so pigmented and dry that it can crack and then you can form a wound which is called as a venous ulcer and in very very severe cases that area just above the ankle the skin becomes so uh, dry and narrow that your leg actually look ends up looking like an inverted champagne bottle with the bottle end of the top and the neck down so we call that an inverted champagne bottle appearance and all that is due to a chronic pressure increase in the veins because the valves are not functioning properly so healthcare workers that is what you need to look out for a patient complaining of heaviness of the legs towards the end of the day discoloration in the lower leg eczema edema pigmentation and of course ulceration being the worst case scenario 
Yes, thank you for highlighting those critical indica- indicators and I think it is uh, clear that early diagnosis and the right kind of diagnosis is effective for management also. Absolutely. Uh, now talking about the management part, let's just talk about the treatment options available. So what are the current approaches to managing varicose veins from conservative uh, methods to more invasive procedures? Excellent. So now that we have understood that the main cause of all these symptoms are a chronic increase in pressure, the treatment is aimed at relieving that chronic increase in pressure, Mm -hmm. which means we've got to send all the blood that is pooling down in the legs back up or reduce the amount of pooling down in the legs. So how can we do that? Obviously, the conservative measures is to send the blood back and that can be achieved by asking patients to exercise so your muscles are contracting and pushing the blood up, elevating your lower limbs whenever you can. So keeping it quite high up above the level of the heart if feasible to send the fluid back up. And of course, you can wear what is called as graduated compression stockings. So now these stockings are designed in a way that there is more pressure at the lower end of the stocking and less pressure as you go up the stocking. So it's as if somebody is sitting down there and giving you a massage upwards, pushing the fluid back up. So all these measures, exercising, reducing your weight, keeping your legs up, wearing compression stockings can all reduce your chronic venous increased pressure and provide relief from venous insufficiency and varicose vein symptoms. Obviously, none of these are cures because these are temporary measures. And so we call this conservative management. Now, the definitive management is to stop that increased uh, pressure, which classically is aimed at blocking off or getting rid of the vein, which is bringing all the fluid uh, or blood down. So say you have a saphenofemoral junction leak, that is a leak in the valve at the top of the great saphenous vein, you aim to block off the great saphenous vein. Or if it's a short saphenous vein, you aim to block off the short saphenous vein. Or if it's a perforator, you aim to block that off. Now, if you think about it, it it is something like this. You have a tank on top of a hill and you have 20 pipes that are taking water up to fill the tank. But one pipe is just bringing all the water back down. So the tank never fills. So your aim is to get rid of that pipe. And so that the tank fills. So now how do you get rid of that pipe? There are three methods that are accepted nowadays. One is a little bit old fashioned and we don't do that much anymore. In fact, most units will not do it, which is the old fashioned stripping of the varicose veins, where you make a cut uh, at the junction where the vein dives into the deep vein, put a stripper down and actually pull it physically out. Very, very, very rarely done nowadays. The two main ways now this vein is blocked nowadays is by heat what we popularly call as laser or endovenous thermal ablation or another method called as glue ablation where we put glue that goes in as a liquid, solidifies quickly and blocks off this vein. So all three achieve the same uh, objective that is stop the increased venous pressure, block off the vein that is bringing the fluid back down. Now, The old fashioned stripping, like I said, is not done that much nowadays because you needed a general anesthetic. It knocked you back a little bit. You had cuts. But with the endovenous laser therapy and the glue therapy, this is done usually under local anesthesia and maybe a little bit of sedation. You don't have to stay in hospital for that. It's a daycare procedure. It is done under ultrasound guidance so that you actually have an ultrasound. You see which vein to target. So it's better targeted. You put a little hollow needle in under local anesthesia, pass either the laser fiber or the hollow fiber for the glue. Again, directed under ultrasound up to the leaky valve and the laser heat is delivered. And so you don't have any big cuts or anything. It's just a slight needle puncture. And of course, following that, you'd have to wear compression stockings for a little while. The glue, some people don't even advocate compression at all. But thermal ablation, I would normally put compression on for about three or four days. Some people put it on for longer, but there's no real evidence for that. So these are the three currently accepted methods. And the most common method employed nowadays is the thermal ablation, what we call uh, laser or radiofrequency ablation. And of course, the glue ablation as well. Yeah, these techniques are actually taking um, very effective and takes lesser time for both the patients and the doctor. It makes their life easier. 
correct so absolutely now, it's more comfortable for the patient it's quicker mm-hmm. the recovery time is hardly there they can get back to work straight away etc uh, etc et there are a lot of ad- advantages to this very true so now uh, for patients with severe varicose veins uh, the surgical options are same or there are something else that is available and how also how do you determine the most appropriate intervention for each patient yeah that's an excellent question actually uh for severe varicose veins the at the end of the day the the process is the same you need to get rid of that vein so the therapies available exactly are the same the uh, uh, open surgery which is rarely done thermal ablation or glue ablation now how do you pick that now this is picked there are several factors that help you to pick it obviously availability of laser availability of expertise to work with the laser radio frequency availability of the glue kit is one of the determining factors and the expertise of the the providing physician is a determining factor whether they have a, a good ultrasound skills etc uh that is one factor but the main factor usually is the size of the vein the amount of reflux what uh, vein is going to be targeted is it going to be below the knee above the knee or the entire length depending on what your ultrasound findings are so let's say you have a very big vein say about a 8 to 10 mm vein almost a centimeter vein and in a male i would probably choose heat that is laser or thermal ablation uh rather than glue because you need to put a lot more glue and some patients don't like the fact that you put the glue there and the glue is an implant so it goes in as a liquid it hardens up and stays there forever so patient choice comes into it as well so some patients say i don't like an implant just get rid of the vein so a thermal ablation would be better so a larger size vein i would choose uh, thermal ablation but some people still use glue you can compress the vein etc if the patient tells you they don't like an implant then you go to thermal ablation now if you are treating the vein below the knee the nerve the saphenous nerve runs very close to the veins so if you're using heat there is a small risk it's a small risk less than 1% of actually affecting the nerve so when you tell patients that and say if you're using glue there is no chance of any nerve damage because you are really not using any heat so below the knee or and for the short treatment of short saphenous veins sometimes uh the patients and the physician would prefer glue ablation to thermal ablation so these are the little nuances that uh, you have to discuss with the patient before choosing the modality of treatment and obviously the patients know, know best they have uh, you know if they say oh, i just don't like the idea of glue uh i don't want any risk of nerve damage then you follow that as well and uh give them these options and let them pick so that's how i usually uh pick and choose along with the patient what is the best treatment modality absolutely any personalization is the key here absolutely um, now recurrence of um, varicose veins can be challenging issue So how do you approach cases where patients present with recurrent recurrent varicose veins after previous treatments? Uh, you're absolutely right. Recurrent varicose veins can be quite challenging. Uh the general approach to diagnosis and what may uh, be the problem uh, that causes the recurrence is usually the same as how you would approach primary varicose veins in that much as you would take a history you would know what kind of treatment has been plan- done in the past if you have access to the operation note etc you would obviously go through that your diagnostic approach would be uh, a clinical examination followed by a very good doppler scan looking at all these junctions looking at the deep veins looking to see if there's any problem above in the pelvis etc so you need very very good duplex scan imaging uh it needs to be done by uh, personnel that actually know the venous anatomy and uh are familiar with interpreting venous anatomy findings so sometimes just sending the patient off for a doppler scan to a diagnostic center may not be the best thing to do but if you have a vascular lab where technicians are doing this venous scan they can interpret it or the vascular physician himself uh who's doing the scan and knows the anatomy i think that's very important especially for recurrent varicose veins sometimes you can get recurrences because of other problems from above so you may need more intensive imaging like uh, a venogram 
whether it's a CT venogram, MR venogram, etc. But at the end of the day, the basics are, are the same. You approach the diagnosis exactly like you would do for the primary and then find out the site of where the valve leakages are, which veins are involved, and your treatment is tailored towards that, as we mentioned above. Yes, that is very true that you've mentioned. Various factors also play an important role. So now before we wrap up, one last question with, would be like, with your past experience, what would be the one advice that would, you would like to give to the upcoming healthcare professionals and the doctors pursuing vascular surgery? Yeah, I mean, vascular surgery is a, it's a fairly broad subject. Uh, it is a, uh, it's a, people think that it's cardiovascular, sur cardiothoracic surgeons do vascular surgery. Uh, yes, there are very similar concepts in uh, vascular surgery and cardiothoracic surgery. But vascular surgery is a subspecialty of general, well, a super specialty of general surgery. So you train a little bit in general surgery and then you have to go to vascular surgery. You need to understand the pathophysiology of not only veins, arteries. So vascular surgeons treat arteries, veins and lymphatics as well. So the so blockages in arteries like the carotid artery that may co cause stroke, art arterial disease lower down the leg that may cause uh, gangrene, ulcers, wound, non-healing wounds. And also the other disease of arteries, which is aneurysmal dilatation. So all of these is important. So if I was going to advise somebody where if to take vascular surgery, I would say go for it because it's a very interesting uh, uh, and a nice specialty which deals with multiple different areas of the body. You're not focusing on one area. Yes, it's arteries, veins, lymphatics, but it's arteries, veins, lymphatics all over the body, and the manifestations are slightly different elsewhere. Obviously, there are a lot of things common with cardiologists and cardiothoracic surgeons in terms of medical treatment of these and also some of the procedures like angioplasty, stenting, etc. Definitely, that is a wonderful piece of advice, Doctor. Now, as we conclude this session, I would like to thank Dr. Riza for giving your time and sharing your expertise with us. And it, this has been an incredibly informative discussion. Thank you very much. It is my pleasure and I hope uh, it's been of help. I'm very happy to answer any questions that might come forth, etc. Definitely, we would love to uh, love for more questions and we would love to have more discussions with you in the future. Thank you. Likewise. And for our listeners, understanding the new essence of conditions like varicose veins and staying updated on the latest treatment modalities is crucial in providing the best care for your patients. And thank you so much for uh, tuning in to today's episode. Remember, if you are a healthcare professional who is eager to delve deeper into medical topics or have questions, do not hesitate to join us on MedSignals platform. MedSignals platform is not just a resource. It's a dynamic space where you can connect with your medical peers, participate in meaningful discussions and contribute to the ongoing evolution of healthcare. So until next time, stay informed and stay healthy.